Hi guys, it is an absolutely gorgeous day here in the final days of summer of 2019 and what a rocket ride it has been for the past three months uh, here in upstate New York, but we are going to go all the way across to the Pacific Ocean to a little island off the coast of western Canada where I have the great honor and pleasure of speaking today <clears throat> with Frank Rotering. And you might recall Frank's name. I have read a couple of selections from uh, this long piece of his work we're going to be talking about in, in the first 20 minutes of this podcast. Uh, Frank Rotaring has an economics degree from Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, Canada. He is the author of two books, including The Economics of Needs and Limits, which we'll find out more about. Uh, he describes himself as an independent Canadian thinker who has studied the ecological crisis for more than 30 years. He says he was a progressive for most of his life, but left the movement because it, meaning the progressive movement, rejects the revolutionary change that is now an existential necessity. However, he wants us to know that he remains committed to the progressive goal of social justice. And Frank says his analysis of what's going on on this planet today is independent in two ways. First, he has no institutional, organizational, organizational or other affiliations that might skew or constrain his thoughts. And secondly, he has worked hard to free himself from the thought control imposed by social leaders. To the best of his abilities, he says his ideas are based on facts and logic rather than conventional pressures, and he has an excellent website called ecologicalsurvival.org where you can find a lot more of Frank's work. But without further ado, <clears throat> Frank Rotaring, come on and say hello to the folks, and then we're going to dive right into this rollicking discussion. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Sam. That was uh, an excellent uh, and comprehensive introduction. And uh, the weather here, by the way, is uh, is awful. It's it's rainy. It's uh, it's cool. Not very pleasant. So I'm happy to be inside talking to you. Um, uh, well, I'm, I'm I'm sorry to hear the weather there is not as uh, as, as beautiful as it is here in, in New York. But I'm sure that will not uh, constrain our conversation. And what I want to do, so guys, we are trying. <coughs> We are making the vain attempt to put 30 years of, uh, of research in, into less than an hour, and we're going to start with about a 20-minute summary for what I have described before and will describe again as one of what I believe one of the most spot-on uh, essays I have ever read uh, and this is his uh, one of, I don't know if this is your grand opus essay or not, titled Ecological Survival and Revolutionary Change, which you can find on ecologicalsurvival.org. So Frank, give us your 20 minute, I'm just going to let you run for about 20 minutes. Give us the summation, and then we'll come back at the end of it and see where the conversation takes us from there. Sounds good, Sam. Thanks very much. Um, just to remind your uh, your viewers or listeners that uh, you know my project is is different from yours. Uh, you do very valuable work chronicling the collapse, hence the name of your channel, uh, sort of recording what's happening. Um, my aim is is different. Um, I still have hope, and I believe I have an ethical obligation 
to to uh, work for human survival despite the odds against us. So this is not the doomosphere, as you call it. Uh, I'm trying to uh, salvage uh, what I can from uh, the mess we've made here. Okay. Let's so, go for it. Um, let's start. Let's start salvaging and and uh, just just don't confuse quote doomers with with folks who do not cheer cheer on people such as yourself. So give us uh, give us your ideas for ecological survival and revolutionary change, and we will. Absolutely. So let me let me jump into that, Sam. I got twenty minutes. Uh, try and keep to that. Uh, if people want to follow along, again, as Sam mentioned, the site is ecologicalsurvival.org. Uh, if you click on the uh, the hamburger menu, uh, you will find uh, the document that Sam mentioned, Ecological Survival and Revolutionary Change. And uh, you might want to open that up. I'll be referring to some diagrams uh, which are useful in explaining these, uh, you know, rather uh, complicated issues. So. This document has uh, two parts, uh, part A about the crisis uh, and the response, and uh, part two is about uh, how we can actually get things done, uh, actually resolve this crisis uh, through revolutionary change. So uh, the first part of this uh, first section is uh, on the ecological crisis itself. Uh, and if you are following along, uh, go, to, go to figure one uh, titled The Ecological Crisis, and you'll see my interpretation of what is happening. And um, what you'll see there is that the cause of all this is economic overexpansion. Uh, the capitalist global economy expanded rapidly, of course, uh, especially in the 20th century and since 1950. And right around that time, 1950, um, we, what happened was ecological overshoot. And by that I mean the violation of multiple environmental limits occurred right around that time, uh, especially with greenhouse gases where uh, CO2 went above its uh, long-term maximum of 300 ppm uh, for the first time in, in a long, long time. So we have an ecological crisis uh, stemming from ecological overshoot, again, driven by uh, capitalism's economic overexpansion. And I think it's very important to divide that crisis into two segments so we can deal with it conceptually. So I call the first part the, the GHG crisis, the greenhouse gas crisis. This is what's normally known as climate change. As I'll explain, I reject that. So there's two parts to this crisis. Uh, one, again, the GHG or greenhouse gas crisis and then a number of non-greenhouse gas impacts, such as habitat destruction, over-exploitation of resources, uh, non-greenhouse gas pollution wastes, etc. Now, focusing on the greenhouse gas crisis, which is critical because that's where the tipping points and points of no return are, and also this is the area that's been so wildly misrepresented, especially by the IPCC and its followers. And yes, you heard right. I think the IPCC is a sacred cow that needs to be um, <laughs> uh, demolished. So my take on the uh, greenhouse gas crisis is that there are two sets of effects, uh, a set of warming effects and a chemical effect. Uh, the warming effects are called global warming, and global warming is basically the, the warming of the Earth's surface uh, due to excess greenhouse gases. And that causes ocean warming, and that in turn causes ocean deoxygenation. And global warming also has an immediate impact on climate change. About 70%, 7% of the warming uh, goes into the atmosphere rather than the ocean, so there is an immediate um, uh, effect on climate change. But most of climate change comes, in fact, from ocean warming, 93% roughly of the heat from excess greenhouse gases goes into the uh, ocean and that in turn warms the climate. So just to make sure you understand this point, climate change is a real problem, no doubt, but it's the end point of all this. It is one of the warming effects of global warming, okay? So I distinguish very strongly between global warming the overall warming effects, and climate change, which is one of the effects or results of global warming. And then the other major branch here, uh, the other major effect of these unsafe levels of greenhouse gases is the chemical effect of ocean acidification, which is caused by excess CO2 alone. Okay, 
so to summarize, we have economic overexpansion because capitalism is a, an inherently expansionary uh, economy. That caused ecological overshoot right around 1950. That is the ecological crisis, which consists of two components, the greenhouse gas crisis and various non-GHG impacts. So as I go along, I'll be referring to the GHG crisis, and uh, now you know what that is. Yeah. And by the way, climate change has sort of been the, um, you know, been the primary um, uh, people have paid most attention to climate change, I should say, because the atmosphere has a very low mass relative to the ocean. So as the planet heats from global warming, we first notice the effects in the atmosphere, the climate. But, of course, there's also major changes happening in the ocean. So we could be calling this an ocean crisis rather than a climate crisis. So you can see that there's confusion here. And I prefer my terminology, as I just explained. Now, let's move on to the second part of this. And again, if you're following along, we're now going to section two of this rather lengthy document. And this discusses what I call the rational response. Now, I've been of two minds, whether they call it a rational response or the rational response, but this is so compelling to me that I've, I put the word the in there. I think it is the way to go. Okay, and uh, I'm looking here at figure two, again, if you're looking at the website. And where I, what I have there is a representation of what I think should be done about this crisis at the highest level. And it's a little matrix with four parts. Uh, at the top is the greenhouse gas crisis. At the bottom are the non-greenhouse gas impacts. And on the left is the present damage, and on the right is past damage. And I won't get into details, but basically, for both the greenhouse gas crisis and the non-greenhouse gas impacts, to reduce our present damage, we have to reduce consumption, we have to reduce population, especially in the rich world, and we have to increase efficiencies. Okay? And this can be done, of course, by modifying our economies. So this is stuff that we can actually impact by our day-to-day -day behavior, our social organization, our economic system, et cetera. Unfortunately, we also have past damage to deal with. Uh, changing our economic system will do nothing to draw greenhouse gases out of the air, for example. Okay, so we have to deal with that as a discrete part of the solution. And I think for the greenhouse gas crisis, um, there are two critical measures uh, one is solar radiation management, which uh, we'll discuss further later on. And the other one is greenhouse gas removals. Okay? And for the non-GHG impacts, um, well, I, there is a set of measures, which I won't go into. Uh, they're all in the documents. I call that ecological restoration. Uh, so to summarize that, again, this crisis consists of those two aspects, greenhouse gas, non-greenhouse gas, and there are present and past damages. And all those have to be discreetly dealt with. And I think once we conceptualize the response, the rational response in that way, those four categories, then we can actually, you know, rationally approach this systematically. I don't see much of that happening today. People are sort of jumping at this efficiency and that, and it is uh, really rather silly. So, it's a, that was pretty basic stuff. Now I come to something that is far more um, contentious. Uh, part three of this first section is called blocking the rational response. So, the rational response I just mentioned has, of course, not been implemented. This is obvious. Uh, and for that reason, we have an existential crisis. Um, and, and, the answer, and the question is, you know, why was it not implemented? We are homo sapiens. We are a supposedly wise and rational species. But, of course, as pretty well everyone now knows, we've done nothing effectively to solve this crisis. Why is that so? Well, let's say it out loud. I think what a lot of us know in the back of our minds. But the rational response would threaten three things. Capitalism economic growth, and rich country lifestyles. 
So, Sam, that's, uh, that's me and thee. You know, we've lived well, and we've lived well uh, in an unsustainable society. So, you know, we benefit. So the rational response goes against the grain both of the system and its ruling class, and us as individuals who benefit from that. So the next question is, how, how is this non-solution sold to us? Why have we, and a lot of us are extremely concerned and knowledgeable, but we've been persuaded somehow not to act on this crisis. How the hell did this happen? Well, I think there's three parts. Uh, number one, the crisis has been distorted, okay, from, as I explained, from overshoot, the real crisis, to climate change, which, have, again, as explained, is simply one facet of global warming. So we have this distortion and reduction of the crisis, and then we have an organization called the IPCC and a lot of related organizations and people authoritatively acknowledging that this is indeed the problem, this reduced crisis. And then having sort of trapped us into believing that, oh yes, these people recognize what's going on, they have basically diverted us for any solutions that threaten this system, its growth, or our lifestyles. Okay? So again, three steps. Distort and reduce the crisis. Authoritatively acknowledge this distorted version. And then, then deny any threatening solutions. Okay? And that means everything but really efficiencies. And how is this done? As stated, the key instrument is this sacred cow we call the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC. And as I explain in some detail in this document, in the third section, and I quote a very good historian named, uh, named Weirt on this, the IPCC was not formed, as most people think, to solve this crisis, the so-called climate crisis, what I call the GHG crisis. Uh, in 1988, when the IPCC was formed, uh, there were independent meetings happening uh, in, here in Toronto, Canada, as well as in, in Austria, uh, by independent scientists, and they were worried sick, and they were trying to get some real radical action going. And the IPCC was formed right at that time, and control of this issue was transferred from those courageous and concerned scientists to the bureaucrats, economists, negotiators, politicians, etc., who for the past 30 years have assured that nothing of any significance happened. So basically, based on its formation, the IPCC took control of this issue from those worried scientists and place it in the hands of people who would do nothing. So, if I, and this author, his name is uh, Weird, I forget his first name, if, uh, if this is correct, then uh, you know, the IPCC is not what we think it is. It is something quite different. And if we have time, Sam, I would like to read the piece from my uh, manifesto on the IPCC, because I think it's going to shock people. And... Uh, well, we'll see later on. Okay. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see how the uh, how the time goes. But 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 obviously, folks, as we're listening to this, th th this is a a tiny summation uh, of this voluminous document that uh, g goes a whole lot deeper. But okay, so let's keep keep moving ahead and and trying to put this document in, in into twenty minutes. Yeah, I'm still trying to reach that 20-minute limit here, so um, I'm working <laughs> on here. Sorry on me. Uh, by the way, I think the most egregious thing that the IPCC has done is to marginalize solar radiation management. That's another major issue, and I think uh, you've had some guests on who've made a real hash of this, including Robert Jensen, and I'd like to discuss that later on if I could. It, 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 yeah. In any event, uh, given time constraints, I'm going to blast forward here. Okay. And I'm going to, I'm just going to read here my summary of this first part, Sam, because I think uh, there's a lot of new stuff here for people. So this encapsulates what I just said in those, those three parts of this first uh, section. Here we go. Around 1950, capitalism's relentless economic expansion resulted in ecological overshoot. This triggered an ecological crisis that has two components, the GHG crisis and various non-BHD impacts. 
The rational response to this calamity includes SRM, solar radiation management, and a range of measures for minimizing our current damage and repairing the damage we've already done. This response was blocked because it would threaten capitalism, growth, and rich world lifestyles. The IPCC was likely established in 1988 to spearhead this solutions denial. Its approach is to reduce ecological overshoot to quote-unquote climate change, attract the concern by acknowledging this diminished crisis and opposing the deniers, and then reject any threatening measures. That's my summary of the first part. Okay. So heading on. So now, you know, having uh, you know, done the Jeremiah, here's what's wrong. Part B is about ecological survival. In other words, what I see as the potential solution. And the first section here is called From Capitalism to a Sustainable Economy. Now, this is a little tricky, Sam, because this involves economic theory, so I'll just uh, go over the highlights here. Um, but I think the, one of the key requirements for moving to a sustainable economic system beyond capitalism is, should be rather obvious, but is always neglected, is we need a new economic theory. Okay, standard economics is tied to this growth, this extraordinary growth of capitalism. It can't serve. Ecological economics, the only real alternative, um, has a disastrous conceptual foundation, which I describe in this document. Uh, neither of those serves the purpose. A new economic theory is required. And really, I spent much of the last 20, 25 years developing that theory. And that is called the Economics of Needs and Limits, as Sam mentioned. Um, I have a book on that uh, and other documents that you'll all find on this website. Okay. And one of the key things about this um, uh, economic theory or framework is that it's based explicitly on an ethical principle, which standard economics, of course, is not. And I'd like to read that out, okay, see if people agree. Here's the ethical principle for the economics of needs and limits. All human beings, present and future, are of high and equal worth. Now, from that ethical stance, I develop a bunch of concepts, analytical tools, etc., in an attempt to produce an economic theory that could drive the transition to a sustainable economy and then help guide that economy in the future. Okay, so in a very brief nutshell, that is that section. Then I come to section two in part B, and it is titled, The Necessity of Revolutionary Change. And of course, I understand full well that revolutionary change is something, you know, abhorrent to a lot of people. It's extremely upsetting, uh, personally and socially, so this must be justified. So I. Uh, I wrote a whole section on that, and I cite five reasons. They're in the uh, summary to this section, and I'd like to read them out. They're all very important, okay? okay? So here is Frank's five reasons why we need revolutionary change to survive this crisis. Number one, humankind's response to the ecological crisis must be proportionate to the problem. Politically, this implies the replacement of the current social leadership, the capitalist ruling class, with a sustainable group. Two, our response must be effective well before tipping points and points of no return are reached. This means that strategies based on modified popular perspectives or slow-forming mass movements are untenable. So something more extreme is required than what we're currently seeing. Number three, Mainstream sources correctly claim that reaching net zero emissions will require transformative social change. It is therefore likely that the vastly more ambitious safe concentration approach will require a revolutionary shift. I didn't uh, emphasize it, but uh, my, uh, uh, my goal for the, the greenhouse gas crisis is to reduce concentrations to their safe uh, levels. Reason number four for revolutionary change is that political analysis firmly establishes that capitalist societies are ruled not by their people or governments, but by dominant groups that derive their power from economic ownership and control. 
pressuring governments for fundamental change is therefore pointless and self-defeating. And five, a much larger issue, revolutionary change is the essential first step in species redirection. Humankind's ecological shift from an expansionary to a contractionary trajectory. And I, in my document, Sam, I, uh, you may have noticed I cited uh, Adam Frank's uh, book, uh, Light of the Stars. Uh, Frank is a, uh, an astrophysicist at the University of Rochester. We've interviewed, I've interviewed York. him about that book. You can, you can find my interview with Adam Frank on here as well, where he talks about that a whole lot. Anyway. Yeah, anyway, that, that is the issue I'm addressing in step five there, that we could be potentially, uh, you know, one of many species in the cosmos that has faced this overshoot issue. Uh, and if that's true, which is what Adam Frank says, then this is now, right now as we speak, our chance, our responsibility to meet that challenge. You know, can we live within the constraints of our planet? And, of course, that is uh, an open question right now. So... I've got a few minutes, I think, so... <laughs> uh, we've, got, we, we've got plenty of time, but I have a lot more stuff, and, and, and I could have interrupted you at least 20 times, and we could have no. gone on for a but go ahead, and, go ahead and finish up this summary, and I'm going to try to figure out which points I want some more elaboration on. So anyway, keep going. It's, yeah, it's good luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so the last part of this is, is perhaps the most contentious, okay, uh, I'll admit. Mm -hmm. But uh, again, a lot of what I think is objective thinking has led me to this. I call this the youth military strategy. And what, the, what this derives from is, is my, my own study of, of, of revolutionary history. And uh, what I see uh, in the revolutions of the past is you need two things, two elements to drive revolutionary change. Number one is you need visceral anger. Okay, not just intellectual objections or even ethical concerns, you need visceral anger. In the past, this was the working class, which was brutalized by early industrial conditions. And today, it is likely the young and their concerned parents who are most potentially subject to visceral anger and could drive revolutionary change. And the second basic requirement is a coercive social force okay, to replace the current social leadership. You know, if we're going to talk about a revolutionary change, we can't play around. Okay? We've got to take this seriously and say, okay, if, if this is going to happen, who or what can do it? And you have to identify a force in society that can, in fact, coercively replace the ruling class. And yes, Sam, I'm afraid that violence may be required in that. So my proposed strategy here is that the young, and I've recently realized perhaps their concerned parents as well, supply the anger and the military supplies the coercive force. Now I realize people may be saying, what did he just say, the military? Yeah, as an ex-progressive, I rejected military action, or I saw the military in a negative light for many decades of my life. But as this crisis has reached the point we're now at, I've come to realize that I've had to drop that and, and look at, at, military, at the military objectively. And when I do that, I see the only force capable of shifting things in the time required. And in the document, in section three, as you've read, Sam, I, I try to analyze uh, where the military might be at today, what has to change. Clearly, they're not ready to do anything like this now, but potentially they could be, and I explain how that could be done. Okay? So, again, you may want to ask me more about that. Uh, but I will... Yes, I, no, no, obvi obviously, Frank, there, there's several things you have said where anyone who knows me knows how is Sam is just not how am I resisting the temptation to be breaking in here but I want you to go ahead I'm, I'm giving you the floor this is not a debate between Frank and Sam this is here for Frank to share his ideas so, so finish out your, your your summary and then we'll go for some shall we say amplification and clarification of some of your of some of your points so 
Okay, Sam, I wasn't going to do this, but since you mentioned Greta Thunberg earlier, okay, and you want to discuss her, why don't I read my concluding comments, at least some of them, to this document, and uh, that will, uh, I think, uh, segue right into a discussion I, I of... Think Gre I think Greta Thunberg uh, and what Bill McKibben and Time Magazine called the Greta Generation is, yeah. is going to uh, kind of... It sounds like... I would think... Now, most people... <clears throat> I think, Frank, listening to you up to this point, would say that you are a 100% champion of Greta Thunberg. So give us your spin on the Greta Thunberg <clears throat> phenomenon, what's right about it and what's wrong about it. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to read his concluding comments because it addresses those issues okay. exactly. And, of course, you're dead wrong. About, <laughs> I presume you knew that about what I think about Greta Thunberg. <laughs> Anyway, I, I here just, we go. I, I just meant, I, I just meant up, up to this point, people might, might think so. But uh, anyway, I've gotten myself in trouble with Greta uh, questioning some. But anyway, I want to hear your, your, your take on, Frank's take on the Greta Thunberg phenomenon. Take okay, here we go. Okay. So this is my concluding comments to this lengthy um, okay. analysis and strategy document. So right. here we go. Uh, in late 2018, Swedish climate activist Greta Thunberg stood before a, a Stockholm audience and delivered, delivered a forceful presentation. And by the way, it was a very good one. The 15-year-old expressed amazement that, despite widespread talk of an existential crisis, no one is acting as if a crisis actually exists. She also insisted that today's rules won't save the world, so these rules must be changed. Her activist approach, School Strike for Climate, is now being copied by students around the world. Although this youth movement is, ex is an exciting and necessary development, it is deeply marred by the fact that Thunberg and her followers have embraced the standard GHG story, the standard greenhouse gas story. For them, the problem is emissions, the solution is renewable energy, and the ages of change are politicians and governments. It is therefore possible that, although millions of fired up students will soon hit the streets, their horrific futures will remain unchanged because of the lies and distortions they have absorbed. To avert this tragic outcome, the young must quickly repudiate the falsehoods and decisively forge an independent path. Moving on with this, the first lesson they must learn is that, quote unquote, changing the rules means far more than eliminating, eliminating fossil fuels. It means replacing the current social leadership and moving from capitalism to a sustainable economy. Here's a key statement, Sam. The core requirement for a living world is not political will within the prevailing social order, but the political power to create a new and sustainable social order. Ecological survival demands revolutionary change, whether we like it or not. Another critical lesson for the young is that the falsehoods go much deeper than they realize. The IPCC is not just a conservative organization that is hamstrung by a clumsy review process. It is instead a deliberate stratagem by social leaders to absorb concerns and deny threatening solutions. The primary reason that SRM is dismissed, solar radiation management, is dismissed is not that it is risky, but that its large-scale adoption might expose capitalism's role in ecological overshoot, thereby killing the goose that lays the golden eggs. The third and most difficult lesson is that the older, again, that's me and thee, are far less virtuous than the young might think. <laughs> in, I know you want to jump in there. Let me just finish it off. No, I'm okay? cheering you on here, brother. Okay, well, here we go. <laughs> in her presentation, Thunberg rhetorically asked, are we evil? She answered with an emphatic no, explaining that most people don't understand the crisis and the drastic changes required. But numerous people, particularly social leaders and their well-informed supporters, have understood all this for decades. They nevertheless remain fervent supporters of a life-destroying economic system because they have made an obscene ethical, ethical decision. Our present is worth more than your future. This means that, to a disturbing degree, the older are evil. Youth strategies that ignore this grim reality are bound to fail. And my last paragraph here, and I'll stop after that, my final point is this. 
any approach that could succeed in salvaging the biosphere will necessarily be unorthodox and thus appear strange and even shocking. The ecological crisis is now so far advanced that only massive and unfamiliar actions will pull us back from the brink. My proposal for revolutionary change must be assessed in this terrifying context. As a corollary, any approach that feels comfortably familiar cannot possibly work. Bold government policies and clean energy initiatives can thus be dismissed out of hand. Far from being enlightened solutions, such measures reflect the cynical manipulations of a social force that must now be replaced by a sustainable alternative. End. All Your right. Turn. Well, 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 well. A amen, brother Frank. Uh, now, <laughs> and, and I really want to thank you for articulating just then uh, better than anybody I have ever interviewed the Greta Thunberg uh, paradox. Uh, okay. Because I, I, I catch more heat when people think when I barely tiptoe, and you're going to catch some heat too. I, I assure you from the yep. from the from the Greta Brigade. Uh, I, I always try to you know like like when you started that, what's coming out of Greta's mouth. Uh, sounds just like uh, what has been coming out of my mouth and in, in, in hundreds, if not thousands, of other people's mouths. Uh, I, I mean, it's, if you if you could draw the line there, it would be fine. But this whole this whole just social phenomenon forming around this, you know, why why her uh, and and. It, to me, it is blatantly obvious. I mean, that, that cover of Time magazine with her in her little uh, Peter Pan green outfit. Did you see that? Did you see that? That she has, is clearly being played by the system. Why would the, why would the, the, the system with a capital S be giving such a voice piece to Greta Thunberg. It's exactly what you just said because it allows the system to keep on going with business as usual. They're, it's like they're throwing us this little bone, uh, right. the, the, the little Greta bone as I call it. And, 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 and it's, it's, it's like George Orwell, you know, give them, what is it, sports, alcohol, popular music, and pornography, and there yeah. will never be the revolution to, you know, to, to sink these, these people, and, and, and this is give them Greta. It's, it's just the, 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 fifth, uh, the fifth wave of George Orwell. I, I mean, am I, am I being too, uh, too ridiculous here, or, or, or do you No, agree no, no, you're, uh, you're basically, uh, you're basically reflecting my own, my own thoughts on this. Greta and her movement are clearly being used by the system. There's no question about that. However, you know, she is causing ferment. She is waking up a lot of young people. She is waking up a lot of young people's parents. So that ferment yeah, is, yeah. is important. And Sam, every, every movement in history starts out naive, starts out emotionally before theory and strategy come along. So I think the better way to look at the Greta Thunberg phenomenon is to acknowledge what you just said, and what I also emphasize, that she is being used by the system. That is true, so let's put that aside. Now, how can we utilize what is there Okay, yeah, yeah. we have to do that. Okay, we have to use this ferment. We have to allow this movement to mature intellectually, conceptually, analytically, strategically. Okay, the bare bones are there, but the flesh around it, the theoretical flesh to make this a more mature, robust, revolutionary movement, that has not occurred. But that's not Greta's fault. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So let's recognize both sides of this. Yes, exactly. Okay? She's being used for social control, but there's potential for revolution in that ferment. That would be my comment. It'll be interesting to see when she does wake up and realize, when she does mature a little bit, and she realizes that she's being played like a fish. Uh, how she, <laughs> are we going to have, is she going to be the new Joan of Arc? But anyway, we have so much uh, to talk about, so we need, we need to leave Greta behind here. I want to talk 
uh, about your ideas for the military. Now, 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 obviously, when you are suggesting that we use what I and a lot of other people, and, and I'm sure this includes you to a degree, Frank, who fully understand that the, I would call it the global military, but certainly using the U.S. military as, as the shining example. I mean, it is the, the, you know, what everyone from Chris Hedges to Alex Jones would, would call the police state that is keeping the, these corporate overlords in, in, in power. It, it, it is the, you know, the famous military industrial complex. How you're suggesting, and, and again, I, I, I don't want to make this sound like a debate. I'm just playing devil's advocate. How, how could anyone seriously suggest, uh, and then with all due respect, uh, that, that, that the military, the, the, the number one thing that uh, the, the global corporatocracy depends on to keep them in power. I mean, you're talking a, a global-wide overthrow, <coughs> a military coup. <coughs> is, is no, there... no, no, no. I, I explicitly... Okay, let me address that point first, um, yeah, well, Sam, okay, and, I'll, and I'll get back to the larger issue. Yeah. You're wrong about the military coup thing, and I explicitly address this in the document. Okay, okay, so uh, this would not out. be a military coup at all. It would be the first stage of a political revolution. A coup is used to remove a non-compliant yeah, government. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I That's not what we're doing yeah. here. This is the first stage of a revolution to supplant what is currently an ecocidal civilian leadership with a sustainable civilian leadership through a limited period of military rule necessitated by the ecological crisis. So I don't see long-term mil military rule. And it, to go back to your initial comments, you, you got things backwards. The first thing to do is to identify the only social force that can effect the required change in the time available. And if that's the military, then whatever, uh, whatever obstacles there are in the way to utilizing that force, we have to meet them, okay? So the first thing is to establish the necessity for military intervention. And again, people have to read my document and see whether they yeah, buy yeah, my yeah. argument, okay? And then how do you do that? Well, I think a massive movement, but not a massive movement of the young, of their concerned parents, of progressives, perhaps like yourself, who have abandoned that non-revolutionary um, movement and have become radicalized. And all those forces have to tell the military in articles, videos, direct contacts, their parents, if they're children of these people, that your ultimate responsibility is to the people. You are, your duty, your professional duty is to safeguard the people. And currently, you're not doing that. You're allowing the people to be destroyed by this crisis, and you're allowing the country, in your case, the United States, to be invaded by foreigners. And that is sea level rise and everything else. So the military currently is not protecting either the populace or the national territory. In other words, they are not doing their professional duty. And I think what the movement, this, again, youth parental movement has to do is to remind the military of their fundamental duty. And then, yes, you're right. I mean, currently, of course, they're a, an extraordinarily negative force in the world. I, I'm under no delusions about that. But again, they're the only force that can do the job. And they have a professional duty, which they know about and frequently acknowledge to safeguard the people and the national territory. If we can forcefully point out to them that they're not doing those things, okay, that they're in fact being unprofessional and unethical, they may shift, they may not. But Sam, really, what are our options here? If, if we do nothing with the military, what will happen? <laughs> we will get a fascist coup. Uh, 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 yes, I, 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 I think that, that that is clearly ev evident. You, you know, I mean, this, this, let, let's go back to Gomer Pyle, USMC, from, from the moment uh, these 18-year-old young men uh, step, into, uh, step into boot camp. Uh, it, it is 
literally, I mean, they're brainwashed, they're, it's beaten into their heads that their job is to, uh, is to enforce the, the very ideas that, 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 are, that are taking down this planet. I, I mean, the order that you were, the tall order that you're suggesting uh, I, I mean, I, I'm, I, 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 I'm not arguing with you that it is going to take a force as big as the military. I, I'm just saying, you know, to, to suggest that this is, it is going to happen is suggesting a, a, a leap of faith. Uh, just, just, What's the strategic alternative? What well, is the strategic alternative? What other plan can you or anybody listening well, well, come see, up? This, this is this is the, the the essential difference the the the, the line between what I call doomers and and apocaloptimism is is that I you know there's a there's been all sorts and this is it, it, not just this interview but really everyone I talk to it goes through the same basic thing we, we understand so more and more of us are understanding the problems more and more of us are understanding the solutions i mean we can have some small debates between ourselves about srm or whatever but more and more there's a consensus with more and more people what the problem is and and, and what the quote we need to do but i think the line between what some doomers refer to as apocalyptic is the fact that the doomers say we're not fighting a losing battle, we're fighting a lost battle. That, yeah, but, you know, uh, and can you just comment on, on when you hear this line from people like me? Well, you, you, you're not talking to, to me then. That, that's, that, that's not my project. I have made an ethical commitment to produce the ideas that will give humankind the best chance of surviving this crisis. I don't give a flying fuck about all the doomers. It doesn't matter. It has no ethical impact. I understand what you're saying. I'm a bright guy. I've studied this. I'm as pessimistic as you are. That's irrelevant. That's a personal attitude. It's not an ethical commitment. Yeah. And you doomers never distinguish between your personal pessimism, which I share, and the ethical commitment, which you should have, in my view, oh. you don't distinguish. Why not? Distinguish. Yes, no. we're pessimistic because things are screwed, of course. But we have an ethical commitment to do the best we can. And the military, according to my analysis, is the only force that can get us there. So the only topic of discussion is how do we achieve this transformation of the military? Well, how do we? Let's let's have let's have this discussion. I would I, I would absolutely uh, cheerlead uh, this idea. I mean, wh where would we, you we even begin? That uh, we've already I've already mentioned several things. Again, their duty. The people, the parents, and, and the and, and and the young. So I've already started that discussion, Sam. We can get back together at some point and continue that, but that discussion has been begun. I think we now have to continue it in a rational way, and look at the military objectively in the in the context of this existential crisis, not past imperialism, which I fully acknowledge. I've read the books. I know my Chomsky. I understand where the military, especially your military. <laughs> You're right, this imperialist force, of course I understand that, okay? But, number one, again, they're the only chance we have, and number two, unless we get to them in some way, within 10, 20 years, there will be a fascist coup, okay? You will be living under an authoritarian regime. That will be a coup, not the first stage of a political revolution. Yeah. So, why would you not, you, you can't lose by trying to influence the military to do their fundamental duty. There is no losing. All you can do is win. So I say that's a no-brainer part of this strategy. Well, you mentioned, and, and, and obviously, uh, I, I mean, even, uh, even our, our little uh, corporate overlords in the IPCC are, are, are saying 12 years, which we don't have to, we don't have to get into that whole discussion, but do we have time? You know, this uh, it, it's, it, uh, as all of this ecological collapse tsunami is gathering speed, 
and, and, and we're sitting here, you know, going up against this gathering tsunami. You know, I was, I know you asked me not, not to, I, I'm not going to ask you to repeat the, the interview you had eight years ago, but I've been listening to this excellent interview. And pretty much everything you said in that interview eight years ago, that most of the vast majority of which I gr agreed with, here we are eight years later, Frank. Uh, we, yep. we have Donald Trump. We have Jair Bozonaro. We have the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative. The, the, the Earth Overshoot Day is, uh, is, is earlier and earlier every year. Uh, I could well, go on and on with this laundry. I don't see yeah, you any could go on and on. So let me stop you. Yeah. Um, but 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 we now understand what we under, we we've experienced all that. We now understand more. And I think if you read my document and again take advantage of a quarter century of hard thinking and reading, then perhaps we can push this uh, forward a little bit and. Uh, in a roundabout way, get to the Trumps and the uh, Bolsonaro's, uh, et cetera. We're not going to do it directly. And, uh, w but the underpinnings of this society uh, is, is the state and the ruling class. We have to start thinking in terms of the state, especially the military aspect of the state, and that there's a ruling class out there. And by the way, Sam, i got to say, one of the main things wrong with progressivism, and another reason for my departure from that movement, is that... They simply will not recognize the existence of a capitalist ruling class. It is always the corporations, the elite, the oligarchy, all words that basically um, um, brush away the reality that any complex society is dominated by a ruling class. This is the capitalist era. That class is capitalist. And that is a political reality. Corporations which progressives like to harp on, these are economic entities, okay? There is a political reality called the ruling class, and that is what we must now be focusing on. And that's one of my main complaints about Chris Hedges, is that he doesn't do that. Anyway, that's an aside. But, Sam, let me just repeat. I fully agree with, with all the, your perception that, that things are going against us, that the situation looks hopeless, this tsunami you talk about is real, what can we do? Well, there's two ways, two things you can do. You can basically give up in various ways, or you can say, what is the best strategy given the reality of our current condition? Stop fucking whining and start strategizing. Didn't somebody say, don't mourn, organize? Isn't this what we're doing, should be doing now? Okay, don't whine, strategize, analyze, do what you can. You'll probably lose. I'll probably lose, but we'll have our dignity, we'll be human beings, and we'll die with our boots on. Exactly. Where you know, This is what, what whenever anyone uh, asks me this, whenever I'm being interviewed, and they say, well, well, Sam, if, if you are so hopeless or whatever, why do you continue uh, dedicating your life to what you're doing? And, and I say, because this is my moral duty. This is why. This is what the universe has told me my assignment for the planet is. And I'm simply not. Even though I think I'm going down, I'm going down swinging. I'm not going to roll over on my back and stick my legs up in the air like a dead cockroach. You know, I'm going to give a little squeak of protest uh, on our way down, and uh, but, okay. but, but I said so we are we are 54, and, and, and Frank, I am really enjoying this. I am really enjoying this. I, I did forget to give to to try to put a warning about no f bombs. You've you've had two, so maybe we can get through the the, the next few minutes. With no, no, more. you said minimize the f -bombs. Oh, minimize, okay, you, were, like, minimize, minimize. you probably did. People yep. are amazed that I uh, even can keep this channel going without myself going into it. But anyway, Frank Rotering, we have really appreciated this, but if you are familiar with my uh, interviews, uh, you know how I, wind, how I wind them up at this point. And that is, if you were not talking to Sam Mitchell at Collapse Chronicles and you did not have an hour 
uh, of free reign, but you had one minute, and the, the mainstream corporate media actually had a microphone in your face saying, Frank Rotaring, you have 60, se 60 seconds to send your message out to this planet in the last few days of the summer of 2019. What would that message, what would that 60 second sound bite sound like? Young people and concerned parents, the world depends on you. There really is no other force. In my experience, um, intellectual argument doesn't work. Ethical concerns don't work. The only thing that works is visceral anger. And you, concerned parents and terrified young people, are the only hope we have for that visceral anger to start a conflagration, okay, that will eventually allow the military to start or to initiate the first phase of a political revolution to institute a sustainable ruling group in our societies and to give us a chance of ecological survival. I didn't rehearse that, but that's about what I come up with. I think that is an excellent, and I think you were right on about 60 seconds. But anyway, st stick around here for a minute after we wrap up, but we're getting ready to have a collapse of global industrial civilization on this camera in a couple of minutes. So uh, one more time, uh, if you want to hear, and guys, you really do need to read this. This is one of the most spot-on analyses. That is, this is all one word, ecologicalsurvival.org, and, and read uh, this, uh, the, 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 all of uh, Frank's, quote, manifestos. And if you don't agree with 100% of what he says, the man really articulates what is going on on this planet and how we are not uh, responding to it and what we need to do. So Frank, I really appreciate you coming on here and speaking with us and more importantly, we appreciate the hard, passionate work you do and keep up the good fight. Thank you very much, Sam. I really appreciate that. Bye, guys.